Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, a podcast that examines aspects of sound and image-based cultural production and its implications and wider issues around it. I'm Paula Blair, I'm the host and creator, and I'm very pleased to be joining you this time from Belfast, my home city. I've come over for a bit of a visit and I'm recording this short introduction during a walk through the rather lovely Botanic Gardens in South Belfast, and very close to the Ulster Museum, where I'm about to meet Elvira Santa Maria Torres. She is an internationally renowned performance artist and action artist. We'll hopefully have a really fascinating chat about her work that you'll get a lot out of. Just to say a really big thank you to everybody who's been sharing and liking and engaging on social media. It's a really huge help. So big hello to you and thanks as well to our regular supporters on Patreon. There aren't many of you, but the ones of you we have are so appreciative of what you do. To find out how to support us financially and how to support by sharing on social media, stick with us at the end and I'll be back with information about that. But for now, I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Elvira. Um, my name is Elvira Santa Maria. I'm original from Mexico. I'm a performance artist. I now based in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. And I have been based here for almost 10 years. Between Mexico and Belfast, I must say that. I travel a lot because my work, performance, art demands that. On performance, there are other terms, I think. Could we maybe just unpack some of the terms that we can apply? Because you do process art and a range of different approaches like performance installation and action art. How do you feel about those sorts of labels on your work? What do you feel it is you do? You know, in Spanish, I use the term art action, arte acción, as a generic form that can't cover performance art, durational performance, process art, or art process, gesture, you know, studying the gestures, combining with photography, or performance installation, I told you, and maybe something else. I like to label what I'm doing because that helps me not to classify in a way or organize only certain ways to perform, but it helps me to reflect what I'm doing. What is this doing in performance art? What are the elements that form performance art and how I'm really working on that? For example, time would correspond to durational performance if I'm interested or in a process. How I'm working with time, that is very important to focus on that and also to say people, this is about time. So if I said I'm going to do a process, art process piece, means that I'm not aiming a result, but to go into a process that people can witness and even intervene the proposal of the materials, the space, and certain principles that I'm going to apply will take us somewhere in a journey in that process. For me, it's important to even call a chamber performance, a performance that happened in a close, cozy space that gives me the chance to deliver something and people focus on that without any disturbance. Maybe I can arrange in a way uh, lights to make something special to happen. Like maybe in the ancient chambers, the chambers in New Grange or in other places, something special happened there and we need a cozy place. For example, that is the need for me to label, but it's a more a work of conceptual work that is in my in performance art or action art, as I call it. That point about location then, you work inside, but there's a lot of work outside as well, a lot of site-specific work. I'm just thinking about any work you've done in Mexico that I've seen images of, and there you may be dealing with things like violent memory or traumatic memory. You know, I've seen images with you with bullet shells in your toes and the objects that you'll find and claim in the actual landscape and things. What do you feel are the differences or the different materials with the spaces that you're working within, whether it's between an indoor event or something outdoor that's an action? For me, it's very important to consider a space or even the situation as part of the art work or even as an element that will define what I'm going to do. Materials as well. I used to say that I don't use things. I don't use materials. 
I dialogue with them. I really think in not using anything. I'm thinking I dialogue with the space, I dialogue with the situation, and I dialogue with the materials. That has to be really a concentration or focus there. The wind can be part of my performance. The wind can collaborate with me if I learn, if I don't ignore that element there in that space or in that situation. Or a person that, for example, on the street, I used to work a lot on the streets. And uh, I have to consider that people, as part of that, if a person is angry because I'm occupying the public space, I have to deal with that as a part of the piece, not as a problem that yeah. comes and disturbs me. <laughs> I will never consider that. That yeah. is unethical. A performance artist must realize that he is provocating something in the reality, social, physical, political reality, and that can't trigger anything. So we have to be prepared for that. If we are really stating that we have to be awake, present in the moment, that is when you prove it, when you take on count all these elements. Just thinking about you saying collaborating with the wind, I think probably one of the first actions I ever saw you do was on Helen's Bay at the beach. You do something with, I think it's bin liner bags, the plastic bags where you let the wind fill them and tie them and make a huge string of them. And so there's these beautiful shapes made across quite a big area of space with the bags. Do you have a name for that? And what do you think it is that's happening there? In general, when I do this kind of works, I don't have any title. Yeah. Actually, the title comes after. And because I can enjoy it so much, or something can reveal for me in that performance, that then come the name. I don't know what will happen. And for me, the title of a piece, of a performance, or even the conceptualization has to come after, not before. I'm dealing with a reality that I don't know. That, of course, I have experience, I can visualize something, but you never know. And I know that as a performance artist, big surprises can happen there. And even with very simple things, like with the plastic white bags, I said, okay, I have this string, maybe I put three or four, and then I try to fly, and then I put many, many. I didn't know how I was going to develop that. And then I remember I wrapped myself with all that and all these plastic bags were stuck on my body. And that was also part of this process that I didn't know that I wanted to do. (laughs) So it's why later I said, oh, that happened and I made my notes and reflect and sometimes I found poetry there. And that is is great for me. So the title or the names, even the conceptualization in, in a deeper way, let us say, because I have always a previous idea. For me it's important to have always an initial idea. But afterwards come more the reflection, more substantial thoughts about the title too. It's a nice idea, the idea of collaborating with the elements around you. Because you're harnessing it, but then you're being close to it as well when you wrap it against yourself or you're just finding a way of visualising the wind in a way, almost. Do you find that ritual comes up in your work quite a bit? The idea of ritual or repetitive actions are things that you need to work through over and over or work through in different ways? It's interesting for me because I can tell you I never repeat a performance as a theatre play or something, never. And we know that always will be never the same. But I'm not really interested to get stuck in this idea. I'm really all interested to explore again and again in different ways, for example, the material or the space or my own um, frustration when I try once and even if people like it, if I didn't like it or something was not on the way to discover something new or even just to do in the way I want it, I go again and repeat it. The idea of a ritual, when I started to do performance in 1992 three. I really made a kind of rituals, really with a kind of play, but really performance, so sometimes with my blood. I have a nurse there to take my blood out, and I make with a drill a hole to a stone, and I make a transfusion of my blood to the stone, <laughs> calling it, I think I call that performance, donation for that igneous, like fire force. Uh-huh. Anyway, but it was with silence, in a kind of chamber performance, but very ritualistic with many elements. The only element of a ritual that was not there is to repeat it. I didn't repeat. 
But yes, many elements were there. Catharsis, not all the rituals reached the catharsis, but some performances in the beginning of my practice were really cathartic. People really cried, and I didn't hurt myself, I can tell you. But I think I organized the thing in a way, the piece make people enter in a story or in a narrative, not maybe in a story, but a narrative that triggered something in them, that also give them a space and a place to deal with emotions. Sometimes they didn't understand what, what I was doing, but said, oh, when you did this, I cried because I remember, or I fell. But there was not a story there. Anyway, sometimes I do something like a kind of ritual of my performance. For example, the last performance I have done in that way was the smoke self-portrait. I smoke a transparent glass in front of my face, and it seems like I'm burning my face, but it's the glass. And at the same time, the glass is covered with the smoke, and my face disappears. And I'm dressing in black, and I become a black, black figure there, a form. And then I do something else, like drawing on that smoke and make appear the drawing on my face on the smoke. And that is a kind of ritual for me. And I can repeat that several times. It's the only performance, but always with variations. Variations in the introduction or at the end, depending in the place, depending in the culture, with the people I am. It's not the same when I do it in Latin America, Mexico, than when I do it in Europe. It's not the same. But uh, at the end, the big element that move people into what I want to bring them is the burning or the smoking the glass. Have you noticed any other differences in how spectators react between Latin America and Europe or UK or Ireland in terms of the cathartic effects or the affect of it? Do you find that it's different emotionally or does it depend what kind of thing that you do? Yes, it can be very different from a culture to another. Depends where it takes place. If I do street actions, usually in Europe, people try to ignore it. <laughs> because many things happen, and people don't want to be part of a joke or be victims of a candy camera or something <laughs> like that. I understand. While in Mexico, for example, in Mexico, in Latin America in general, people is more um, willing to assist you okay. if they think you have a problem. Right. Usually they are going to think that you have a problem. Right. Or to ask you okay. what is going on. Or they take time to stand in front of you and observe you to figure out what you are doing. And if not, they ask. And then uh, usually I'm interrupted because people want to talk about that. And I like that because I can't stop to talk about. But when I speak with people, I'm not talking about, oh, this is performance art, my art work. No, I'm talking about what people bring, what is the concern of people that they have seen in my art work. But in Europe, it's difficult. In Northern Ireland, people can do that, but people can be very tough here. Yes. It's the toughest place <laughs> I have ever performed in my life. It's very, very tough. And I'm learning how to approach in public space people. But I told you, depend of the people, depend the culture, depend of the situation. Sometimes depend of a person passing by and doing something. The artwork can change completely, upside down. And I have to be prepared to embrace it and continue with that change. The issue of contingency is a really prickly one in performance art and live art in general, where you as the artist are the most vulnerable person in the room or the area, whatever it might be, because anything could happen. And I think most audience members would tend to stand back and think there's a natural barrier that forms, probably because we are fairly true by cinema and theatre to not step over a threshold but you can plan that for everything and you don't know if you're doing something outside whether somebody's going to come up and accost you or demand to know what you're doing or whatever. It's really fascinating to think about cultural differences from place to place where you might be doing it because you're internationally performing all over the world. But here also I'm very conscious about the, let us say, relatively recent history no? and how people has to close themselves emotionally, not to avoid being hurt emotionally, but there there was a danger. And sometimes the mechanisms of resilience mechanisms in ourselves tend to close us for many things, not only for the possibilities of violence or aggression or whatever. And uh, no, we have to consider that as performance artists. 
And also my purpose or my aim is not to make myself vulnerable, even if I become yeah. vulnerable because I go to a public space, for example, and I do something that is out of the urban codes, and that is a provocation. Wanted or not, is a provocation. But uh, it's why I, I, I'm very interested to learn and to know first, to know, but be very conscious. What do you want to do that? What really you want? To be a victim in front of the eyes of the people? Or to be, no, you want to give something to people, something positive? Think about it. Something negative, put yourself as a victim. That always is good. Get the result as you want. And then, okay, now I really want to do this because I want to tell this to the people. I mean, tell something is like, I want people, for example, see something that maybe cheer them up. What can I do? And also they said, oh, that is very strange, like in a dream. Why happened to me? And then maybe he goes and then, oh, but yeah, I remember that or something, something of this action might be part of his life, like a dream, to work something else, something in a deeper or any different level, or maybe being forgotten. It's why I think we, we need to know very well our intentions in public or in close or indoor spaces, because an action really, really is powerful to affect another person. Would you like to talk about any exhibitions you've been part of as well? Because there are times when you're not necessarily working live or you're working live as part of maybe a collective exhibition or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there was one last year and I didn't get to see it, unfortunately, but you were part of the Bounce Arts Festival Mm -hmm. just a few months ago. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? Yes, I was invited by Hugh O'Donnell, uh, their typical gallery, with another for artists, female artists, to make this exhibition. Being performance artists, we don't used to make exhibitions, but he knew that we had some works that might be interested to see aside our performances. I present a photography that came out of a process piece that I made in El Salvador. So I went there to a village that in 71 occurred a big massacre. Thousand people, children, women, men, Old people were massacred by the Salvadorian army. They wanted to cut the resources and the sympathies in a radical way to the guerrilla. And they massacred many, many people. And I wanted to go there and see what happened after so many years. How was the place? How people cultivate their memory, hold the memory? Or how people live after that? Because they're still alive people there. So I went there and I was speaking with people, some who suffered directly. I mean, all the people living there had lost a member of the family in that massacre. In my process, I went to walk to the hills. People described me, you know, here the girls of the village were taken and raped and then murdered. So it was very, very strong for me. So it was so strong and so awful that in one moment I asked myself, why are you here, Elvira? Anyway, it's a long story that the reason why I'm there, but I'm going to focus now in this um, short uh, narration why in the gallery this artwork. As I told you, I made an art process there, a piece of art process, and I was just there looking at the soil that is very, very red. It was very impressive because it's really like blood. Of course, it's the quality of the soil, but anyway, and I start to observe, and I start to discover uh, these uh, bullets, casket bullets, and then a person from the village told me, oh, there are many. You go there, there are many. The army was set there and start to shoot on the village. And I went there and everywhere you could just move with your foot a bit the soil and, and discover those bullets. So it was horrible. It was, I mean, all this violence resonate in me. I stayed there, I start to collect some of them. I didn't want to do anything or much because I felt overwhelmed by that. And then I start just to, I don't want to say play, but in a way to explore, explore the quality, physical quality. And I reached that image, putting these casket bullets between my toes. And then I said, this is the steps of memory. As I told you before, that the title come after. It was hours, many hours. I was three days there, many hours, only for that picture. And I said, this is the picture. And then I published it in my website. 
Hugh O'Donnell saw that and he told me, I want that image. That is the way it came to be part of an exhibition. First is even discover an image through a process. Or sometimes I have ideas, maybe I, I need, I, I want this, but I don't know if it's, it's going to work. And I do some something, I perform many times things in different angles, and then I said, this is the picture. But behind there's some performative work that supports, and a kind of investigation that supports an image that I deliver as a photography or even a video. No? Actually, video I haven't done much. The title of that exhibition was I Stepped Out and She Stepped In Again. Yes. It's a really fascinating title. And then just what's come out of that one image. And obviously that was in amongst other works by other women artists. But that idea of I Stepped Out and She Stepped In Again. And thinking about the footsteps that you're maybe retreading but you're walking amongst where people had been before where violent things had happened before it's a really wonderful title that did you come up with that title it was Hugh because he wanted us to perform and maybe create a dynamic to perform together and create a dynamic where we can't really collaborate by taking the place of the other uh-huh. and maybe the materials and retro, um, how do you call it? This is re- in Spanish, retroalimentación. Mm-hmm. And feeding back with the action to maybe deviate our performance, solo performance, and become really an engaged collaboration, is why he decided. And also, when he told me, and the image of your photo or this performance would be part of that. And I think all was really emerging in a kind of organic way, many things, elements, opinion of the other participants. I think it was really, really good event for me and very interesting to develop this dynamic suggested or proposed by him. I was wondering as well about the use of body. Performance art, I mean, that's your primary tool, really, is the body, but I was wondering, does body come up, or do you think it comes up as a theme very much in your work? Or is it parts of the body? Because, I mean, what you've just talked about there, it's centred really on your feet, Mm -hmm. what your feet are doing and where they are and what they're engaging with. You know, or in other works of seen you do it you're putting something together with your hands I was wondering what you thought about that you know how much your body comes in what is the idea of your body or the relation you have with your body will be that will give you the parameters or give you the way you perform some performance artists especially young performance artists that are now in the very sexual very active mm-hmm. you know moment in their lives are very concerned about that so they go to the body, the naked body, or they go to explore more, or certain, any concern they have in relation with that sexual body or gender body. I was never interested yeah. in that. Yeah. I was never had this concern. But I was concerned in the presence mm-hmm. that you need for a body to be present. But the presence is more complex. The presence is your body, all your mental faculties, your beliefs, your thoughts, your know, and also how you relate with the others to your body. In general, in my work, my body is my presence. And my presence that I want to bring with this presence reveals something. Can be a hand, can be the head, can be the whole body. I used to dress in black to neutralize a little bit any meaning, but actually you cannot because also the black color has a meaning. But anyway, to not put other contents that I don't want people to focus on and then explore. And in the exploration with the reality outside, I found that my body will perform. And sometimes I didn't know that I wanted to do that with the foot. But I went barefoot to work on that land. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to stay with shoes. I mean in El Salvador. I felt so, so bad. And I felt that that was a kind of sacred land of people that die. Mm -hmm. Innocent people. And I didn't want to step with my uh shoes. So it's why I went on. It's why, and then I discovered that oh, it happens like that usually in my performances, or when I have a clear idea of what I want to do, I engage my body in the way I need. But for me, it's, or I, I think, you know, and I feel that I involve my presence, mm-hmm. not my body. Yes, uh-huh. not only my body, my presence, and hold it together for me is important. I don't want to divide and make these dichotomies. And this dualistic, the dualistic way to be a person that is more than a body. But without that body, I cannot be. Yeah.
If it's all right, then could we think about your collaborations and your work as part of the collective Be Beyond, who are based in Belfast, and maybe some of the events connected around them and your involvement? You know, on your own, in your own right, you're an international artist and you perform alone everywhere else and have collaborated with many different artists as well. But how does that compare with? being part of you know, a member of a collective and how important is being part of a collective in what you do as well? Yes. For me, it's, it's fantastic that Be Beyond exists as a group that diversifies at the same time in a collective, collaborative group to perform and also in a group that organizes and tries to promote performance art. There's different aspects of Be Beyond there. And sometimes, for me, I need to be more in one or in another. Sometimes I need to promote some events, some ideas that I have, and then I collaborate with the committee. And some others I really need to go and, and enjoy, because I enjoy very much when I perform in this way, collaborative, like black market, do it. Depends, depends. But Be Beyond is one of the few collectives or groups that have these two aspects at the same time. It's a collective for performance or performing, but it's also a collective to organize, to make a publication. Yes, to promote, but also to defend the art form because <laughs> yes. it's not easy to establish performance, not only in the art scene in, in any country, but in dialogue with the people there. Always there's something wrong there. Yeah always is disturbing always to someone but it's part of its existence I think it's part of raising questions through actions through performance in the particular way to collaborate with them performing with them is interesting but sometimes I don't find any connection with them There's, I don't find that they really collaborate they repeat and repeat and repeat very much the same there's not really risking anything. Then I apart a little bit. I'm with them, but I separate a little bit as a way to collaborate, saying, you know, I'm going to do my solo, okay. and I'm going to just come when I find a good idea to collaborate. Okay. For me, there's not collaboration. If it is just to be together and to do the same, it's, for me, this is not collaboration. Collaboration is a dialogue and is a debate, a debate in action that can report a real real emergence of reflections in aesthetics and poetic that Bibion is missing. It's not happening. Sometimes, eh? sometimes. But repeating so often these monthly meetings maybe doesn't allow us to really... Or I don't know, actually, now that you ask me, I don't know if it is that the reason that we don't have the time to reflect or we have really to propose and to work how to come together in different ways. But we need to debate, not only in action, but also to reflect about what we are doing and other themes around the practice here in Northern Ireland. No? I suppose then, if it's okay, could I ask you about your experience of being in Northern Ireland? You know, what's that like for you as an artist trying to work here? I mean, you said earlier this has been the most challenging probably place for you to perform, which I can well imagine. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time when I was living here going to the Be Beyond Month Plays and being quite peripheral to those, but being, you know, for a while, I think it was almost my unspoken job to be the person who mediated with the general public and people would be a bit freaked out about what was going on. And so I was the person to go, oh, they're artists, you know, they're just playing, they're just having playtime. It's interesting, you can join in if you want. You know, and it was, you get talking to drug addicts or alcoholics that were sitting around in Ryder's Square or families on the beach and that sort of stuff. That was quite fun for a bit, but yes, it must be, I think because here, and it's okay for me to say this, you never know when it could tip over into violence. There's always that hint of a threat there. So I was wondering about how do you feel, how does it affect you being here? Yes. In general, Northern Ireland has been difficult for me. It is a very different culture, Mm -hmm. no, than Mexico. The language. Yeah. I thought that I, I, I knew how to speak English, but then I discovered I, nothing. But as I told you before, out of this interview, I'm a, a kind of dyslexic that when I need to speak another language, I'm translating myself 
In the last maybe three years, I started to flow a little bit without thinking much in the words that I'm using. What is the way? What is the form to say this and that? But it has been very difficult. The language, especially the language. In relation with the performance, only in public spaces. When I do something in, in a safer space, you know, I can relax a little bit more. But uh, I'm very interested to explore on my own, and I have done it, the public space, and really enter into a dialogue with people. And if I get that, that will be a big achievement for me, a big achievement. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to do something solo and without cameras around. So I can invite some witnesses, and maybe a camera can take a photo, a zoom, but from far away, and let the action speak for itself and see if I can connect with people, or people, even if they don't like it, I can make a dialogue with them, engage with, in a dialogue with them, and relax them, or not. This is not really my aim, but it would be great if I can do it. Another thing, the jokes. I cannot understand all the jokes, or all the jokes are not funny for me. And that, that is very important, because that is part of the deep identity that a group or a social, a social group has. But I started also like flowing a little bit, speaking English. Once I realized that I was laughing and I said, are you laughing? You didn't understood that joke. <laughs> also, it's the context. People have a context. People know things that I don't know. And when a joke cracks, I well, explain me. That. I explain joke is, uh, is worse than a joke <laughs> yeah. that you cannot understand. <laughs> anyway, I point it because it's important. It relates with identity, and identity has to be with the others, and the others are important for an individual. This could happen maybe in another country, speaking English country or China, maybe. But uh, the weather, the weather also is something, no? I need yeah. some. Yes. Uh -huh. But I also, as a good performance artist, maybe you don't like my performances, <laughs> but I consider myself as a good performance artist when I can solve problems in action. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. I mean that I learned how to feed myself in this country, how to live in this country, how to make the best what I have. And then I start to appreciate, I don't like rainy days, but anyway, that also has given me time to retreat more than before and read and write. It's why I think I'm a good performance artist in life. Can I ask you about the work you were doing with Salt a while ago? I'm just trying to think back, because this is probably a few years ago now, a lot of the pieces you were doing with Salt. I'm worried in case I'm mixing it up with Brian as well, because I, I know the ones you did where you were lying on the ground and the salt was on a black sheet or a piece of paper or something, but there was, I feel like I'm remembering one with an umbrella. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so that one was in Germany. Would you like to tell us about that, using salt as a material? Yes. I use salt in the same way I have used in for uh, the two other times I have performed, the only two times I have performed afterwards, this one. In Canada, in 2007, I made a art process there, three days, four hours per day, and I have different elements, and among those materials, I have salt. And I start to blow salt. And I discovered a very nice way to shape, to draw some something dunes. And if there was an um, accident on the floor, that makes something. It was really, really fantastic for me to do that work. And then I let it, I leave that idea for a while. And then by working other concerns about Mexico and all that, and reflecting about how bad the situation, how tragic, I thought in the insult to express something about and then I remember that performance and I got the idea to draw the Mexican map, blowing salt for a long time. And that took me, I made that in Mexico, in Oaxaca, in the Contemporary Art Museum in Oaxaca, for three days, eight hours per day. I started with four little piles or mountains, <laughs> hills of salt to blow into the middle and start to shape the map of Mexico. And that was great, it was really something. And you cannot see, but there was a camera filming from the top. There was an exhibition at the same time. You enter into a room, there's one gallery, three rooms. You enter in the first, and you find a fish, a black fish, 
in a fish tank. And then you continue to the next room and I'm doing that work. You don't see the camera because it's very high. You see only me working there. And then when you go, you see the map from up that is better to, to observe because the room was small. That is the whole of the piece. But I performed three days shaping Mexico. Wow. Wow. And then I thought I have to make this piece three times. Mexican map, one with Canada and one with the United States. Okay. And in reference to this NAFTA, the economical treaty that we have, that has been a big disadvantage for Mexico, and I'm really, really sure from that time all of our problems started, even the drug dealer, all that, from that really unfair treaty with these two countries. So I want to develop that. It's why I made in September, last September, I made the second part of this project. And I need to go to the United States to finish there. <laughs> I had a visa and I think I have some chances to go there and, and blow the soul there. <laughs> I hope so. Just on that then, thinking about its place but also the geography of these places and geopolitics as well, it must come through, whether even if it's not explicit, but it must be an implicit theme coming through, whether you're in Mexico, Canada, the States, anywhere else in Latin America, or here in Northern Ireland, it must be a really big issue. I mean, has anything been coming up about borders and borderlands? I was thinking to do something there. I need to find a, a space. I'm thinking in the Golden Thread Gallery, maybe they are interested. I have to propose it soon or in England, just to make maybe the, the islands together with salt. Yeah. No? I, I will see, I will see. But it really I want to concrete or to finish this idea with these three countries. And I have had very interesting responses from both pieces. People really start to comment and to talk and to discuss and to dialogue. And when that happened, I said, that is a good animal that make people to dialogue, to discuss, to debate. How was it then doing it in Canada? Because it's such a huge continent. You feel like Canada is so far away from Mexico, but really you're quite close neighbours in terms of there's this one country between you, but actually they're joined together in this huge continental mass. So what were the responses like in Canada? Actually, when I was shaping that map, by blowing, you know, by blowing, it's not like having your pain and try to <laughs> make the proportions, yeah. you know. In a way, I start to, I have enough space to shape also United States uh -huh. and a little bit of Mexico. Yeah. But the main was Canada. Mm -hmm. Many people was interested in the meaning of salt. What is yeah. your meaning of salt, Elvira, they asked me. And I think it was interesting for them because it was, you know, this superstition, and I like very much superstition, actually. <laughs> but this superstition that salt might bring bad luck. So many people were thinking, you know, Elvira, why the salt? What is the meaning of the salt? They were concerned. I was really not thinking to attack them through their superstitions. But salt is an element or a, a mineral that has living meanings. Yeah. So when you start to perform that, as a shaman or as a healer in Mexico, if they throw you salt, <laughs> you will feel ill or you will start to be a bit concerned because that, that still affects us. I think people that think that they don't believe in such things are liars. <laughs> or they want to lie themselves to calm them down, to reassure that... Uh, the, but we are connected with the meanings we learn in our families in, around and all that. And then people start to be concerned. Are you going to curse us with salt? Like, no, 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 not at all. But then there's other stories that I can tell you. Salt, for example, was used by the Romans when Carthage rebuilt against the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire defeated them. They went to Carthage and they massacred the people and they threw. I think tons of salt on the fields, planting fields, 
to avoid to grow anything in many, many years. Really coursing, but not just by the, let us say, the concept, the idea that would disturb the people there or the other people that were under the Roman Empire submission, but physically was an effect on the land. And I said, we are still living like that. If your economy, politics, can affect countries and can dry the lands of those countries and the lives of people, in that way, yes, that has a relation. And yes, I spoke about it openly that I consider that since this economical treaty, NAFTA, started, Mexico started to fall in the crisis that hasn't finished. I hope now with the new government, at least we start to overcome and to solve many problems, or start to, only to start, because it's huge. The problem is too big in Mexico. It's too big to be solved in six months of government. But anyway, but yeah, I pointed that. I pointed yeah. that. I mean, those are the legacies of colonialism one way or another anyway, aren't they? That a country, something is taken away from them, you were oppressed or something, and then generations go by and the countries that originally did that to them think very little of them and put the people down and don't allow migration. And it's, well, actually, it was your ancestors did it to them in the first place. That's why all these problems arose. And there's no then culpability, there's no responsibility. So maybe it's reminding people of that as well. It's, well, our white people ancestors caused quite a lot of problems in the world, actually. Yes, we need to go to history, memories. We need to reflect what happened before about the economy. Many performance artists are not interested in the economy. Yeah. They are not interested really in deep politics, only in their own politics. My body, my right, my right. I said, no, wait. When we are going to combine this side of the rights and side of the duties, we have to comment beyond our individual concerns. Of course, when you have a very, very good work based on your biography without being a biography, that can be something, and I respect it. But just work your biography as me in my rights, I don't believe in that. It's really atomizing and it's really making more individualistic society. Do you want to say anything about the symposium last year, or two years ago now? Goodness, it was in 2017. Being in public. Being in public, yeah. Being in public. Would, would you like yeah. to say anything about that? Yes. You know, I propose that, not as a symposium, but that project to be beyond in 2014 or really? 13. And then I couldn't be here, but they developed it as a symposium, and I think it was great. We had the chance to sit and discuss a lot of issues about this, uh, performing in public. And was a key, I think, quite, um, not productive, but quite revealing for many people. That we had sometimes some ideas, ideals of what we are doing, but we are not reflecting what is happening there. For example, what you have just told me before about speaking with people that was watching yeah. from outside. We have to be aware yeah, how yeah. people see us, feel us, and think about us. Otherwise, we are missing good part of that. And we are really not committed to entering dialogue with yeah. that people. I think we discuss this about this and other um, and other issues and for me was great. The only thing is that it happens among artists. Very few people, out, outsiders, were attending the event. That is my only critique. But the rest was well organized, was fantastic, and we need to continue that dialogue and debate. I have very fond memories of the... Because I just happened to be in Belfast the week that it was happening and um, attended the huge monthly meeting that coincided with it. People reckoned that that was not just the biggest that Belfast or Northern Ireland had ever seen but it may have been the biggest collective performance action in Europe ever because there were so many people there. I scribbled around in chalk with that one. I was just writing on the ground what people were doing. <laughs> you know. So that was amazing but also what made it really funny was that there was also this was in Customs House Square in Belfast and I think it was a bike gang or a moped group like a club or something had also made that their meeting point at the same time for a huge outing they were having so these two quite massive things descended on this one square in the city centre at the same time and were perplexed
relaxed by each other and it was incredible it was just something amazing and so that idea coming back of collaborating with whatever's around you they couldn't help but occupy the same space they had to just exist side by side for an hour yes but actually they tried to occupy but we occupied it and we We didn't give them much space to them and and then they had to leave But anyway, that was the potential for a, yeah, a, a real yeah. encounter. They stayed there for maybe half hour. Yeah. They were commenting, laughing and all that. All was okay, not any conflict there. But yes, that was a moment that, okay, maybe we could invite them in a way to be there. But it's difficult also. Two groups, different aims, different ideas, different reasons to be there, to come together. Usually it's easier when a person decides to join or even two that, okay, they born on, but when they were with the motorbikes and all that, I think that it was a bit difficult. But yeah, that, that was uh, interesting. I wrote, feel free to join in ah, and chalk in the ground ah, yes, in front yes, of them. That's, yeah. That's right, I didn't that. That's right, that <laughs> was the invitation, but... Nobody, no. nobody took it up, no, because no. I had decided to be silent, but to just write. And I was just describing everything that was happening. I was just writing cheeky things, you know, I don't know what Christoph's saying or Sandra's dragging a plant around you know stuff like that just trying to make it a bit of funny and silly it was overwhelming how many people were there it was incredible and there yeah, were more people really and there were people that stayed long to observe just to see what happened yeah, there and, yeah, yeah but it was massive because <laughs> yeah, a performance was, artist yeah was it was quite I remember it was an unseasonably warm April day and there was I remember a woman sunbathing and she was there the whole time and she was still there when Sinead and I cleaned up and she was still there two hours later when I went for the bus there (laughs) so there were people who hung around and asked what was going on and some of us sat at the side and just tried to explain it but how could you explain it some commentaries I think just curiosity and again not coming from a place of either feeling or emitting threat but just what's going on who are all these people and when you explain to them what was happening they thought oh okay well I'm here so this is what's happening then (laughs) so it was kind of accepting I suppose I think it was a kind of critical mass that uh, that impressed people you know to say okay there's a movement (laughs) Is there anything you would like to talk about? Would you like to tell us maybe about something you're going to be working on or ideas you've got for the future? Yes, I'm working now in a project I call Performative Resilience. I plan to give workshops, which I call laboratories, for people to observe and to reflect how they have resisted many things and how an action, a gesture, a practice a discipline, whatever you want to do, my structure might help your resilience if you need it. And how that also can give you the tools of your own, let us say, poetry, of your own way to see yourself more positively when you achieve something in action. And especially because I'm going to do it in Mexico. I'm really committed to go and do free laboratories or workshops in different communities just to try to help. There's a lot to do regarding the violence that had happened, is happening, and still will happen for a while. And I'm I'm engaging my practice to do that. And also develop some processes regarding that. And then also I have some invitations to perform with Black Market. We are still on, (laughs) all people. (laughs) <laughs> it's still on and other invitations to, to perform. So. Fantastic. Great. So it's the best place to keep up to date with what you're doing? Would that be on your website? Yes, very soon I'm going to publish some information and the places I'm going to perform. And what is coming, and I wanted to talk more a bit about this, is a project that I'm organizing with Brian Patterson and is part of Beyond Projects this year and is Humanism in Process. Ah female performance artists at work. It's going to happen during the week of the International Women's Day. Oh, great. I propose this project to Bibi Young because, you know, the members of Bibi Young Artists are more than 70%. 
and then we don't have something to just to focus and see what is the practice of female performance artists and address some issues to discuss about uh, all that, no? So that comes the, that week of the International Women's Day and the second part will come in May, from the 4th to the 12th of May. So I think that's a nice place to round off and we've been talking for over an hour, so... <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank really you, wonderful. Paula. Thank you very much. <laughs>to your audio visual cultures with me Paula Blair and my special guest Elvira Santa Maria. This episode was recorded in Belfast and edited by Paula Blair. The music you've been hearing is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 and downloadable from ccmixer.org. If you are enjoying what we're doing and you find it useful and interesting and you want to help us keep making more and to keep keep improving with every episode please 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 support via patreon.com forward slash av cultures it's quite easy although it's in us dollars if you're in the uk it is quite easy it does all the changes for you and pledges from as little as one dollar a month get you quite a lot of extra goodies in addition to the free episode every other week you can also support with one-off donations of any amount of your choice via paypal.me forward slash p-e-a-b-l-a-i-r if you would like to keep in touch with us and be part of the conversation, we are at AV Cultures on both Twitter and Facebook. And you can have a look at the website for more information about everything that we're doing on audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com. If you feel like you want to record something yourself and have it as part of our umbrella of the Audiovisual Cultures general project, then give us a shout as well and we'll see what we can do. For now, thanks so much for listening and please keep supporting and doing everything you do. It's so much appreciated. Thanks and catch you next time.